this is IBM Museum. And behind me on the bench, I've got several IBM token ring adapters out. Certainly in past videos, mostly with the token ring cabling, I had a few of these adapters out and showed the markings on the adapters, the green dots, green dot with the 16 slash four. I've shown the token ring adapters in the PCMCA variety, those little credit card that for the laptops. You've seen the, um, the PCI versions, even to that 100 megabit version in prior videos, but I'm going back to the very beginning with token ring at IBM here, or at least when it started to be released out to the systems. I'm wanting to cover things, I'm, I'm hopefully covering things in the right order, and just in one particular case, I'm trying to kick up a little bit of dirt on this, um, just to get a little bit of discussion going further on how this all relates, just something that I've noticed a little bit. But let me get turned around, I'll probably go through here and I can get the the webcam picture off would probably be good. And I do have links that I'll bring up. And of course, all those links will be in the video description as well so that people can pull up this information. Now, I'm not necessarily saying it's the first, um, but it looks the most prototypey. And for this particular adapter, I'm actually going through and um, tearing it apart a little bit, pulling off, I pulled off heat sinks. Um, this one's a little bit more grimy. I think there's um, even a capacitor that fell off on one of these areas and I don't, I thought I had it. Okay, it was loose. I, I had it taped. <laughs> I thought I had it taped on there, but it was loose. It, I'll, I'll track that down later. But this, you know, beyond the silver cap chips, um, I mean, just the, the, the design of this looks very heavily. And of course, we've got images up at the Arden tool now. I've gone through and most of the microchannel token ring boards, the documentation has been really good. Uh, Major Tom really has added some uh, information. The pictures I went through, the EEPROM images. One of the aspects here is I'm going to have to desolder these these EEPROMs are soldered in place. And of a particular aspect that we're gonna cover in this topic is they have this socket here. And this is for what they call the, the RPL, or I typically call it the Ripple ROM, Remote Initial Program Load, that on the Ethernet adapters, as you've probably seen, um, I, I'm trying to remember when I've kind of gone through and covered the Ethernet aspect where a lot of time it didn't have an involved microcontroller, you know, really effectively processing power on the network adapter like Token Ring did. And typically they had one socket on a lot of manufacturers um, making Ethernet boards that that was the... That was the Ripple ROM. That was what uh, EEPROM that you had to have in there to go through and boot over the network. You didn't necessarily have to have local drives onto your system. Um, probably the, the one place I've shown that is back in the day for the, what is the iClass videos that I did. And I showed just booting on a, a Model 25 and it being able to go through and load DOS over the, the network. Really cool little process. Now these initial adapters, and this is you know just a plain green dot adapter. This is a four megabit token ring. IBM went through and they didn't even give it a speed as I've got the page back here. They just called it a token ring network adapter slash A. And this is the initial, what was referred to as the long card. And then IBM went through and they condensed it down and it 
got a little bit more of the conventional appearance that we'll cover in this video. Um, probably the next adapter to bring up is this microchannel version. This is considered the short 4 megabit version again. And that's when IBM has gone through and condensed that one large so-called silver cap chip that's on the, on the board. And it's got the two, just like the longboard had, it's got the two socketed, in this case, EPROMs. They're actually mask proms in this case. I mean, they're not, they don't even have an erase window. They're on the board for control, the, the processing power of this board. And then it's got a socket for that ripple ROM once again. So you had to have, you know, an extra EEPROM in there that would allow this board to go through and boot over the network. And that image is up at the Arden tool. I need to go through at some point and, and basically add that in. Now, for the, and the, the silver cap chips are kind of a challenge to see sometimes in the, the ring light. But there you see the chip identifier, that 51F1439 ESD. And these chips went through and they did change a little bit in the cycles. That's why I want to kind of the, the, I talked about that dirt that I'm wanting to go through and kick up. And these on the right hand side, these are the 8 bit adapters. And really, in some of these cases, these things in particular, the one EEPROM, the labels on these really degrade. And these, these look a little bit ugly, but they, I have, several of these adapters and the reason that I that I have kind of these versions out is it's it's better for me to go through and copy these EEPROMs that look a little bit more ugly than mess with the other ones that have a little bit better labels on them that I can take pictures of ultimately. Now this stuff for being 8-bit and the ISA models you know being different from microchannel that's not likely to go up at the Arden tool. There's just a stronger interest in, in the, the microchannel aspect. Now, I have the two boards, even though they're the same, you know, these can sometimes have the different EEPROM images between them. Uh, you'll see bodge wires that are on one and not the other. Um, these are both the four megabit adapters. You, and in fact, you see the, the, the little green dots missing on that one. I'll need to put a green dot back on here <laughs> to not get confused. And the silver cap chips, again, they're a little bit hard to see, but there's, you know, that one. And even a different silver cap chip. So they're effectively the same board. And you see even for here, you know, the interesting aspect you see, there's these, these surface mount chips. There's a couple missing in that corner on that one. And they're there on this one. And I mean, this could be an earlier adapter and where some of the, the this chip functionality is thrown into the silver cap chip. I mean, going through it's be a very involved process to to go through and get kind of uh, wiring diagrams for these adapters. But it very may, may very well be that um, you know one of these predates the other by a little bit for those changes like that to happen. Now. The one of the interesting things I saw kind of looking these over too, these are in a little bit nicer um, condition here. And they still have the socket for the so-called ripple ROM again. And these are, you know, and it's 8-bit. You'll see this with the ISA adapters as I bring those up as well. It's got that switch block for setting 
you know, the, the settings of the adapter are established in that switch block. Some of these are labeled a little bit better as far as the switch block, but then you've got the booklet that tells what those do as well uh, that I have, and I can probably cut co even cover that at some point myself. Now, in some cases they go through and they, you've got black print on the so-called silver cap chip makes that reading that a little bit easier. And these are the 164 adapters. I think I made a comment in the, in the cabling at the time of the going over the cabling of how much these adapters looked similar as well for the four megabit and the 16 slash four megabit capable. Now, this for, for all that, one of the things that kind of perked my interest is on that silver cap chip, it's got that 51F1439. And if you remember me reading off numbers before, that is the same chip that is on this microchannel 4 megabit adapter. And here it's on the 16-4 8-bit adapter of the, you know, apparently capable enough to also go and to be able to, to work at that 16 megabit for, um, per second rate. Now, it may be that IBM went through and just they basically limited in this, you know, this uh, uh, design. They, they could have a chip that would be 16 megabit capable, but maybe just it, since it was uh, easier to produce or heavily produced, going through and putting that on a 4 megabit adapter instead. But I just thought it was really kind of interesting that those... And you'll see that theme again of how these chips can match up because there is quite a variety as well between these adapters and, and what chips it has on it. As I go through and show a little bit more of these, um, we'll see that, that theme come up a little bit here and it ultimately leads to the question that I'm that I'm I'm trying to determine. So, going on to the uh, this is probably a, a real good adapter. It this has, you know, this is for 16-bit bus. It's it's gone through where it's 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 expanded or should be a a board that's able to be in a better computer, have increased performance than the 8-bit adapters here. You know, these are for the IBM PC. You even saw them in the MOL, PS2 MOL 25s, MOL 30, of course, sometimes. But this is going up to, you know, the IBM AT or a 16-bit system, whether it's IBM or not, that this board could be in. And there's some, you, you see the bodge wires, you see that switch block still there. This still does look like a little bit of an early adapter for that bus type. It's got both the DB9 and, and that RJ45. It is a 16-4 adapter. And that bracket and, and sticker looks very new compared to how the board is inside. These labels on there. And this is kind of interesting, too, for the fact of the, um, for a separate EEPROM chips. There's 40 pin here, and then probably, I think this is probably 28 pin um, down here. That this may be, in fact, the, the Ripple ROM that's in this design. Now, here is a you know, undoubtedly a later version. It's a little bit more compact. 
the the switch block really gets identified. In fact, this is effectively for the silk screen markings on this. This is effectively, um, you know, might be the Japanese origins. I've seen one of these. I'll have to look a little bit more. Okay, yeah, the 16-bit, the ones I was talk, thinking of here, going through to where the the silk screen, you know, it tells the the capacity of these ram chips that are on there and the that's how token ring started out too is that shared memory aspect you know i should probably be pulling up links and everything else and showing this on the screen but maybe this is kind of the show and tell aspect you see that odd byte even by um this is the sockets probably marked for yeah you see that rpl they don't have the i in there you know i was I often say it more as remote initial program load, Ripple, um, but that's fine as well. But, you know, those those more elaborate markings on the silk screen there, that switch box, switch box is, uh, it's identified by the, the switch positions there, but not really necessarily the, the, the functions. And even for these long, switch boxes that that IBM put on here there the layout between the adapters it was identical for what that position did and that way in their in their manual they don't have to really go through and modify it anymore they can do the diagram you see um, the markings there whether it's and see that's got that RPL indicator on a switch uh, box there, and you only see that one 40-pin EEPROM. So this has the the Ripple ROM effectively built in there as well. And you you instead of adding a chip to a socket, the newer adapter you just go through and you can switch it on or off. It has where you can use a shielded twisted pair or unshielded twisted pair and we saw that with the cabling video and then it has the ROM address the IRQ um, P slash A I'd have to look a little bit more further and then the RAM and then even the speed down here at the end 4 or 16 you could switch Either way, and of course, IBM came out with this, those so-called auto adapters later on. I'll go through and show those. I mean, we saw that in the PCMCA style. I do have a lot of the auto uh, token ring adapters in the ISA form, and I can't remember if I, I, I probably showed it across in that earlier cabling episode because the auto adapters typically just have the RJ45 on there but I had that micro channel version of the of the auto adapter as well now the interesting thing I was seeing here for all that this being the, the 16 slash 4 again let me figure out my orientation and these are the microchannel equivalents that this is viewed as the short you know it's a it's a reduced length 16 4 adapter and the reason I, I I bring out these and I can go through for the for the page and and show this uh, once I kind of complete this little portion of the show and tell but there is the, in fact, it might be good to show this one first. We see the, the numbering on that silver cap chip of 02G1394. It even has the marking of Japan in this case on that. And that goes through 
And then it's actually interesting in a way that that 0 to G1394 is basically the older chip style. And there is that 0 to G1394 on this. So the that silver cap chip effectively matches up even though the EPROMs are a different size between the two adapters for and what we'll, what I'll do is I'll just set the adapter on top of you know between it matches for the chip on the ISA and the microchannel version and so here and these it's interesting that both of these are in that black lettering and you can see that that 50G6144, which is effectively a later chip than the, that 02G1394 chip, uh, but these match as well. And that's probably a good break for me to go over a, a web page. Um, I'll, uh, you know, I can go through and at least um, before I kind of continue on the show and tell, of how those chip versions affect things as well. Okay, so this link even has a, a page anchor within it as well to go to a particular spot down further on the page. And it is covering those short, so-called short adapters. Get to where I can interact with the page as well. The short 16 slash 4 token ring adapter, and it goes through for that identifier of that zero, U0, U09 for that silver cap chip, telling that it's either a 02G1394, which is the older chip, or a 50G6144. That's the newer chip. Now, even though that adapter is the same, and it's a, it's a functional equivalent between whether it has either chip style, there's no components otherwise that are changed. There is some of that EEPROM code that can change, but you can use, it's interchangeable between whatever chip is on the board. But on the the page I'm, I'm going through and of course scrolling down and it has this entry for the difference and I, I forget what that C also here that link brings up I mean I could I could drive to that but that's fine um, but it talks about Windows 95 can detect the difference between the two install a 16 slash 4 with main chip 02G1394 and Windows 95 is happy. That's the older chip, but install a 50G6144 and it Windows 95 will report an error. Your token, your IBM 16 slash 4 token ring is not set up correctly. And then after that warning message, it'll continue to load and that, that, warning message is it strenuous it despite the warning coming up the adapter works fine but there's some difference to the newer chip that windows 95 flags in operation about that and so let me get back on the screen myself i'm going to go through and hide the browser page just for a moment I want to bring up another page and I have it somewhere around here. I just can't lay my, my hands on it right now for where it might be. I've, I've got my EduQuest stuff set, set off to the side and it's probably somewhere within there, but I'll, I'll uh, have to locate it. Let me get to the point where I can interact with this page as well. And all these links will be provided in the video description. So there's the EduQuest token ring board. 
and you see for that U1, it has the chip 50G6144, just like those other adapters. That's the later chip. And on an EdgeQuest, and even for a model that's able to run Windows 95, I mean, there are the higher end EdgeQuest that have a 46 CPU and you have enough memory you're able to run Windows 95 quite capably. Whether it gives that same error or not from this adapter might be interesting. And the, the EduQuest EEPROM is, you know, there's a, there's a picture that people can click on for that link when I provide it in the video description. I won't go through and do it here, but it's shown us at 40 pin that U question mark in the diagram. And it's a 40 pin EEPROM, um, very similar to what probably the code that would be on these, um, these ISA models that I've got out. So let me get going through and turned around again just to cover a little bit more show and tell here and hopefully won't get too long a video. I'm, looks to be under a half hour at this point at least. But with the, as, as I said, with the later adapters, IBM got to the point where they, you no longer had to have the separate Ripple ROM EEPROM. This has got just the two EEPROM chips that odd and even. It's got the Ripple image within these two EEPROMs as well. And with a microchannel board, of course, it's in software settings for the setup of this that you're going through and you're choosing to boot over the network. And it knows from that to run the, the Ripple code. The, on the ISA version, we've, we've seen where it's identified of whether you're going to RPL this board or not. You just, the, the RPL image is within that 40 pin EEPROM. Now I know for the EduQuest board, that EduQuest token ring board, having that 40 pin EEPROM that it does go through and is able to remote boot as well. It has that ripple code in the, in the later, you know, in the later versions of these token ring boards. Once IBM went to that, where they put that ripple code, um, just as one image, one effective image, whether that's an interleaved EEPROM set that's on the adapter or it's in one EEPROM itself, it's a, that's a larger capacity. They, they just never went back. It was all, it was always incorporated within the adapter uh, from that point forward. Now, another factor, and I'm gonna get into this deeper in later videos, is that IBM had a, and we're gonna see this in, when I get it, working with the 8239 token ring hub, and just in kind of looking at the performance of these, these token ring adapters. And this, there's even a link within the Arden tool of where these have, the performance of these have been measured against each other as well. Um, just to get a better indication of what style adapter would be good for, for which environment. And these certainly these, so-called short adapters on the microchannel world, these are, these are good boards. You can even see at the time that I went through and going through and find these boards and talking about the, the days on eBay where these things were just pennies on the dollar. They were surplus since they'd been installed in so many locations, this eBay sellers, I think I was even paying just a cent or a few pennies a piece for bulk lots of these adapters. And I was always looking for that, 
Z02G6144 chip on there just to, you know, if I happen to have this in a Windows 95 capable system, that it wasn't giving me any incidental error messages, whether it was just popping up on the screen and not really meaning anything at all. But I, I went through and you can see the selection that went. I've got much more of the adapters with that particular chip um, otherwise than, than, the, than, the old, the, the, than the newer version of that chip. But, and even for this, I selected a board that's got the, that 02G1394 chipset here. And you'll notice that the easy problems, I've got them hand labeled. I've got a little a sticker that I came up with. I went through and burned these images years ago myself uh, to put on that board. But this is the trace and performance. And these are the EEPROMs. You had to have the EEPROMs on there. I think that puts the board in a so called promiscuous mode that it basically just sees all the broadcasts on the network. And goes through, and as we we'll see in this, in this, um, this little the page of information. This is 15 pages. I will provide a link to the to the electronic version. Of course, it's up at the Arden tool. It's part of these links. But I thought it was easier, even easier than me going through on the the screen and pulling up the the link to this PDF and going through and scrolling through it. Just because it's a PDF, uh, they go through and they they talk about there. There's even an 8-bit adapter that was also able to do this, this trace and performance. Um, but in particular, the microchannel aspect, they talk about that personal system too. Um, and then for the models 50, 60, or 80, model 70 is not mentioned in there. Just we see that overlook sometimes I don't think IBM is definitely just leaving it out for a reason but it it wasn't included in there I'm trying to think of the other aspect that I saw the one time before that they didn't have a mall 70 in there as well but let's go through the overview as I've always said I can hold things up to the camcorder and read them better this way the IBM token ring trace and performance program is designed to assist users of IBM token ring networks in problem determination and performance analysis of the network. I mean, I could pull out my books and I've got, and I've got token ring troubleshooting books and things like that that are really handy references. Um, it, undoubtedly, those books do cover this aspect of this. The trace and performance program measures the ring activity and stores data only on the ring to which it is attached. However, that ring may be connected to other rings by network bridges. The program will capture data from the ring and save it on disk or diskette. It can then present several different views of this data, either in detail or in summary to aid the discovery of problems on the ring. It also collects and stores data relating to the max, uh, to the amount of, excuse me, relating to the amount of traffic on the ring at any given time and can present this data as a percentage of the maximum amount of traffic that the ring can handle. They're giving the requirements that you have for the 8-bit version, either a um, a PCXT, PCAT, or um, model uh, 30. And it's interesting that they, they don't cover a, I don't see it labeled the identified to where there's the PC side of things or the PCXT. They're labeling that PCXT model 286 which has a 286 CPU. Maybe there it's just the memory requirements or something else, um, possibly for those lower end models that they're, they're just not covered as well. Um, 
but you either have the IBM Token Ring Network Trace and Performance Adapter 2 for the PCs or PS2 Model 30. So there's an adapter that's undoubtedly something like that uh, for the PC side. I don't know about the Trace and Performance ROMs in, in that instance, and certainly in this instance, it has the separate Ripple ROM slot. A socket on this on this adapter so it's not all integrated just in the two EEPROMs of that adapter and then it also talks about that you have the network trace and performance adapter A for the PS2 models 50 60 or 80 and that is achieved by just the changing out the EEPROMs that are on this adapter. That makes it into the trace and performance adapter for the micro channel version. So uh, copy of DOS version 3.3 or higher, trace and performance package, a uh, program package, and that is up at the Arden tool. And then the IBM LAN support program So going through on page two, the installation, it gives an idea of the programs that are there, starting the trace and performance program, initialize the IBM LAN support program, and then it started with a shell program of TAP EXE. And I've run this in the past. I think it'd be kind of cool as you go through and get that 8239 set up to have a system with the trace and performance adapter on it to be able to to see that data going over the, the network or give a performance indications. So then they show what the trace and performance program looks like. on the screen, what data can be captured, and then the options for selecting things like the trace functionality, and that's what that brings up. You're getting a file name, it actually store is storing information to disk or diskette okay there's the data that can be presented on the screen and going through to where you can Press the F8 key and go through and enter MAC addresses. Choosing to exclude or include the addresses on the list. Okay. And then you have the trace analysis. Okay, your panel two screen going through with many options there. And then what it's displaying for MAC addresses of destination and source. There's your performance facility. Where you can you can go through and measure the token ring performance or report token ring performance.
Okay, and just what the different screens look like. They will get rather involved with how they can appear too. And when I printed this, I could have gone through and printed duplex or whatever to save paper, but that's fine too. Works really good for me to go through and show these things. Talks about the performance facility panel three. And there is, you know, where it's really getting, showing these graphs. And the counts, the performance facility panel four. And you have to remember, this is showing it in, you know, at the lowest level of basically a monochrome display or to that sense that it's not, you know, the picture perfect graphics, but at the time, you know, that was what had to be used. I mean, this could be probably ported and come up with a, a newer level to be a little bit more prettier. There's the panel five. And people are welcome to look through this PDF that I'll include the electronic version in the link of the video description. Okay, we're getting into some pretty good data here again on the screen. This effectively what would be shown on the screen how many frames per second, bits per second, utilization. And the frame size. The count for all that. There's your basic troubleshooting. And what error messages can be displayed and how to go through and decode those errors. And then the completion and information regarding new versions of this program will be, will be included in the release update ship group. And as far as I know, the, the trace and performance program that is online that is the latest version that's out. Who knows, that may get um, updates in a way. I have to figure out why my, yeah, my chair rollers get settled in here. So if you thought that this was an informative video, you enjoyed it, go ahead and click on that like button, please. And subscribe to my channel if you've not done so already. That's notching up every day. I've been uh, really happy with how it stepped up. I am getting ready for the, um, within about a dozen days or so, just shy of two weeks, I'm making that um, trip to Dallas, Texas to Computer Reset. And I will be there at the same time that Clint from LGR a um, little bit more famous YouTuber than I am will be there as well. I'm looking to meet him and do some shopping, get my van loaded up from items in Computer Reset as they go through and try and clear that building for later on this year, being able to put the building on market and kind of wrap things up for good. So it's a good opportunity for me to get down there and... Um, make a, a good trip of it, but I should be gearing up more and more in these next 12 days uh, for making that trip and and doing that. And certainly uh, that'll go through and it's on the same day. I've got a live stream. Who knows? I may go through and I may try and do a live stream um, on my Saturday mornings like I could do from 
right before when I go to computer reset, they don't want to allow really any video taping within uh, the facility itself. Um, Clint, in the years ago when he did the the review inside that most people are aware with computer reset, um, they allowed him to do that for that purpose, and it was cut down a little bit more that he was the one doing the videotaping and had people to go through. And it's going to be a little bit more busier this time, more accumulation of people there, and just that environment. They don't want to um, have that liability for anybody getting injured or anything like that. So, um, But there will be coverage, undoubtedly, from him for that aspect, and I'll do what I can from that to inform people, and then people will see what the fines I, I go through and pick up and in uh, in later videos as well so you know set your calendars for that or get ready know that i'm doing that sort of thing and i'll work around that schedule to to do as many videos as i can but just be aware that that is coming up so that's all i have for now this is ibm museum thank you